Hi, this is Tristan with the University of Advancing Technology giving a bokeh depth of field tutorial for Unreal Engine's DirectX 11. A good supplement for this tutorial is udn.epicgames.com. Before we get started, make sure that you have the correct renderer turned on. So that's under File, Switch Renderer, and you want to have DirectX 11 enabled. All right, before we get started with bokeh depth of field, we need to create a texture to be used for the bokeh effect. So I'm going to open Photoshop, go ahead and make a new file, and we're going to make this 128 by 128. Um, we don't want the color mode to be grayscale. We'll have Unreal Engine handle that properly. It's going to come back with an error if we do that. So I'm going to call this T underscore bokeh uh, pentagon. Okay. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to fill the background layer with black by holding Alt Backspace. And then I'm going to select the Polygon tool and make sure that it has five sides. And I'm going to drag out a polygon that is close to the size of the image in question. And I'm holding down the space bar to reposition it while I'm dragging it. And then I can change the size by releasing the space bar. Then go ahead and make sure that the color is white. And then just give this a little bit more visual interest, we're going to add an effects layer. So go to the FX tab and select Inner Glow. Now in the blend mode, instead of doing screen, we're going to do multiply. And we're going to select a black color. And then the source is going to be the center. I'm going to expand the size a bit. And then we'll just reduce the opacity so that it's not super visible, but it'll create that kind of hazy look to it. OK, so I'm going to save this out as a Tarja. I'm just saving on my desktop for right now. 24 bits is fine. Okay, and then in UDK, let's go ahead and import this file. So that's the bokeh pentagon. I'm gonna put this in a package called bokeh grouping textures. And some of these things don't matter, but what we do wanna do is we wanna make sure that the texture group is bokeh. And the compression settings, I'm going to select one bit monochrome. Okay, let's go ahead and make the post process chain that's necessary for this. So I'm going to select new post process chain. I'm going to name it PPC underscore bokeh underscore chain so it's clear to me what it is. I want to make sure I put it in the same package as before, which is bokeh. And then grouping, I'm just going to call it post process. Okay. Quickly save my package. So in this post process chain, we really only need to do is we want to add an uber post process effect. I'm going to connect the input to the output of the scene render target. And then, so under depth of field, we want to select bokeh depth of field. And then we can change the depth of field quality. I'm going to go ahead and use high. And then in the bokeh texture area, we want to plug in the actual bokeh texture that we have. Um, now, I'm not going to affect any of these other properties because I want to make sure that I can still alter those properties in the world properties of the level rather than having to do them in this chain. So in order to get that to work, you have to make sure that you have the uber post process effect node selected and check use world settings. I'm going to go ahead and also check show in editor so that we can see it clearly. Go ahead and save your package if you haven't. And then we're going to go to view world properties. And just as a simple example, we'll go ahead and plug in this post process chain. In the world info under rendering, there's an option for world post process chain. And if I plug that in, you'll notice that it gets a little bit different. And then I'm going to enable depth of field. Okay, so now you can see that the bokeh effect is working. So if I were to change the inner radius out from there, you would see how it gradually gets pushed further back as I change the inner radius. So just a quick overview of how depth of field works. Um, there's a few properties that you can affect. Inner radius is how far from the center of focus the area will maintain uh, focus essentially and then will gradually fall off along that focus inner radius. The focus distance is explicitly where in the scene the uh, the focus is positioned. The default settings of depth of field don't allow it to get blurry near the screen but if you have a max near blur amount of anything that's greater than zero you'll start seeing the blur happening up close. So if I were to change that value to one and then start pushing the distance out and then actually reduce the focus inner radius to some value that is below the value of the distance, then you would see how the depth of field starts popping in in areas that are up close as well. And basically you have to think about it like this. If your focus distance is not as far out as your focus inner radius is, the chances are that you're not going to see any blur up close. So if I have the exact same 
numbers for both of them, you'd see there's only a very, very tiny bit of blur at the edge of the fall off. Now, if you change the blur kernel size, that will affect um, basically how large the depth of field effect appears to be when you're viewing it, so that the quads that are rendering that texture will be much larger. And you could do that in an example where you're trying to create a very out of focus image that then comes into focus in kind of the classic film style. And then the, the one property that is incredibly important to be aware of is the falloff exponent. Because the lower the number is for the falloff exponent, the more gradual the blur will be. It has a much more natural transition. However, that means that there's a much smaller area that is fully in focus. And if you make the number really high, such as like a 10 or a even 100 or something like that, then you'd notice that there's almost like an exact line where there's a cutoff. Generally, you don't really want to do something like that. Let's go ahead and set up a really small cinematic that utilizes this effect. Okay, so the first thing I need to do is I need to create a camera. So I'm going to go to Actor Classes, and I'm going to find the camera actor in the common properties, and I'm going to drag it out into the scene. Now, this camera can be aimed really easily by just clicking on the eye to lock selected actors to camera. And we can get the initial position of the camera that way. Really, I'm going to aim it so that it's basically looking at this little object here on the floor. And then I'm going to click off of the lock selected actors to camera so that I can utilize the camera. Okay, then open up the properties for the camera. And there's something that's very important that you're going to have to adjust, which is you need cam override post process alpha to be set to one. Otherwise, your camera is not going to be able to do anything to affect your post process. Anything that you don't check is not going to explicitly change from your default properties. So whatever is in the world post process will maintain itself if you don't enable it. And in my case, the only things I actually want to animate our depth of field focus inner radius and the depth of field focus distance. So let's go ahead and open up Kismet and let's make a really quick matinee sequence. So I'm going to go to new event level loaded and this is going to start the camera action automatically. The other thing I want to do is I want to go to new action toggle toggle cinematic mode and I'm going to hold P and click to make an all players node and I'm just gonna make that the target then I'm going to enable it on loaded and visible and then the output of that will be a new matinee and I still have my camera actors selected I'm gonna play the matinee sequence there I'm gonna open up the matinee right click anywhere in the uh, empty space on the left I'm going to add a new camera group this is going to be called intro cam and I'm also going to add a new director group. And the only thing I'm going to do here, because I only have one camera, is I'm going to make a keyframe that is using intro cam. So any camera groups that you have available to you will be something that you can access in the director group. And then you'll notice that while we're looking at this, it's going to be actually displaying what the camera is looking at. Okay, now there's a couple more things that we're going to need to do in order to make this work. We're going to have to add a float property track that allows us to adjust the depth of field properties. So I'm going to right click and I'm going to add a new float property track. And I'm going to go to cam override post process and I'm going to pick DOF focus distance. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to expand this a little bit um, up to the five second range and I'm just going to leave it there. I'm going to select the movement track and I'm going to make two keyframes, one in the middle and one at the end. And these are going to be our two animation transitions. The first keyframe I'm going to click on, and then I can rotate the camera around. I'm going to rotate it and have it looking directly at the, uh, the valve there. And then I'm going to click on the third keyframe. I'm going to make it look at directly down the hallway. Now, there's a couple of ways of figuring out how far the distance is supposed to be, but I find it really useful to use an event track to give me an output that I can use in Kismet. So I'm going to make a new event track. So right click on the intro cam, add new event track. And basically when it looks directly at the valve, I'm going to make a new event track and I'm going to call this focus underscore valve. And I'm gonna click on the end. I'm gonna output a new event track. And it's gonna be focus underscore down hall. And then you'll notice the matinee now has two different output nodes. And if I want to adjust these, I can hold down control and I can just drag them to reposition which order they appear in. Um, this is going to be helpful to me because I want to basically get the comparison between the object that I'm looking at and the camera. It's as easy as selecting our camera. I'm going to right click and I'm going to add a new object variable for the camera. And then I'm going to select the valve and I'm going to add a new object variable for the valve. And actually, since I have a light all the way at the end here, I'm going to make a new actor for that. Um, so new object. 
And then I'm going to select new action, actor, get distance. And I'm going to compare the A to the camera actor and the B to the static mesh actor. And then the output will be a distance, which is just a float value. So I'm going to hold down F and click, and that'll make a float. This is going to be outputting that value into that float. And then I'm going to select a new action, misc log. I'm going to expose variable by right clicking and selecting float. And then I'm going to plug that float into the log. I want to make sure that this is going to output the comment to the screen. Um, I'm going to type in the word distance so that it's making it a little bit more clear. Pretty much that's all I'm going to need to do to know how far away from the camera that valve is. So I'm going to do one more of these. So I'm going to hit Control W, duplicate it. The only difference is instead of using Static Mesh Actor 4, which is the valve, I'm going to use Static Mesh Actor 3, which is the light fixture. And I'm going to have that output for focus down hall. And then just for the moment, I'm going to switch the cinematic mode so that it is not hiding the HUD. And then if I were to play this, we'd see that we get a distance value for each of these objects. And then you can also open up the console and see it that way. So it's 629 and 3,567. Well, those are pretty good values to plug in to know where it is that we need to affect our focus. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn on hide HUD again. And so for that focus distance track, let's go ahead. I'm gonna click on the, the movement keyframe so that it's close to the area that I want it. And then that focus distance, I'm going to hit uh, well, actually, I need a keyframe at the beginning, too. So I'm basically going to make three equivalent keyframes in the focus distance property. And then uh, what I can do is I can set the value for the first one to be 0. I can set the value for the second one to be 629. And then the value for the third one, I'm going to average that out to being 3,500. OK, and if we want to preview that, let's just kind of slide the matinee over a little bit crunch it in just a bit and go ahead and play it okay so now we need to adjust a little bit of the um, the focus inner radius if we want to make this look a little bit clearer I can do a new float property track this selects depth of field focus inner radius and we can make the inner radius go from small to a little bit larger as we go on down the hallway. And that can be simulating in a way, sort of adjusting the aperture. And uh, again, because it's a float property track, you can just basically adjust it normally. So I'm going to go ahead and actually duplicate the keyframes that I have for focus distance. And I'm going to stagger them a little bit so that the focus distance isn't immediate. So I'm holding down control to drag these keyframes around. So basically, it's going to start out in a position and stay there for a little while before transitioning. So it's not going to just completely cut through from one object to another. Not bad. Okay, there's one other thing that I wanted to bring to your attention really quickly, which is if you go to the world properties and change your um, game type to something like UT Deathmatch, then I'm going to disable this uh, cinematic. So I'm just going to break the connection between the lo loaded and visible. And I'm going to just play so you can take a look at this. All right. The depth of field is handled on the gun as if it were depth of field relative to the pixels that are rendering behind the gun. That has to do with how the gun is like structured in code. That would be something that you would be able to get around if you were programming your own setup for how the gun works, but the default setting is that the blur is influenced by pixels in the scene and not by the pixels on the gun itself. One last really useful thing to know about how depth of field can be handled in Unreal Engine is you can actually make kind of a prototyping material. Um, so let's go ahead and make this really quick material that will be able to do that for us. So I'm going to make this, um, I'm going to group it in materials, and then I'm going to call it M underscore DOF focus mat or focus distance. And then we really, this is incredibly simple. So I'm just going to right click and, well actually it's probably easier to search for. I'm gonna type in depth and we're gonna look for the depth of field function. 
And then you hold down L and click to make a lerp. I'm gonna connect that lerp to the emissive and the alpha is going to be the depth of field function. And then I'm gonna make two constant three vectors by holding down three and clicking. Oh, I actually made three. One of them is gonna have a value of red, and one of them is gonna have a value of green. So it's just solid red and solid green. Um, actually, I think A should be green and B should be red. If I go ahead and confirm that. Now I'm gonna go ahead and take this material and apply it. So what's really interesting about this is it's actually showing you where your focus is based on your depth of field properties. So if I were to go into the world info and start adjusting these, I could, for example, take the focus inner radius and pump it down and then you would see that start to contract. And then if I change the focus distance, you can see how it's now showing you a really natural gradient of where the actual focus range is. Even more interesting than that, you can actually visualize the fall off exponent. So if I pick higher values, you'll be able to see the solid green areas are the areas that are fully in focus. So this is a really, really useful troubleshooting tool. Um, you can apply it to any object. The only thing I would be careful with is um, making sure that you only do this for prototyping because obviously it's gonna look awful.